and he was a student in Harvard, and he is now a member of the Royal Geographical Society. And today he is here to talk to us about his experience in Mongolia. And just in case there are two exits, one on my left and one on my right. Thank you. It's pretty pretty smart to point out the exits. You know where to run if the talk is bad. So. Um, yeah, thank you very much for coming so late in the day on a, it's Thursday today, isn't it? Almost the week's over. I'm delighted to share my experiences with you. Um, so my story starts last year, actually, in 2018. I was actually going through a pretty low point in my life. Um, and I was on a plane bound for Western Mongolia to the Altai Mountains. And it's a small little twin prop plane, runs about once every two or three days. Uh, the flight was going smooth. It was, it was a flight I've done dozens of times before. And suddenly the plane started shaking a little bit crazily. And sure enough, before I knew it, people were getting thrown around the plane. You know, if, you know if something's wrong when you look at the stewardesses and they freak out and they were all crying. So everyone in the plane was going nuts. And what we were actually doing is we were running into a sandstorm. That was what I took from the plane actually itself. So Everybody's freaking out, except there's one guy next to me in the plane, an old man in his 80s, and he's totally calm looking out the window. And I think he was just sort of thinking, okay, well, if this is the way I go, so be it. Everybody else freaked out. We tried to make an attempt to land twice, uh, and both times the sandstorm caught up with us, became more violent, and eventually we had to divert the plane to another airport. And again, the sandstorm caught up as it was moving towards the east. And running out of fuel, we finally made a diversion into the Gobi Desert and successfully landed the plane in an area that was about minus 25 degrees. The airport was actually closed. I remember the, they landed the plane, the pilots got out, smoked a cigarette, told us to get off the plane, and then took off and left. And we were just sort of in the middle of a place called Delanzagad. So I want to first explain to you how on earth did I end up in the middle of winter in this very remote part of Mongolia on a plane in the middle of a sandstorm. So my story starts in England a few years earlier. I was uh, about 14 years old, uh, studying in Hong Kong, when one of my closest friends passed away of what's called an orphan disease, so diseases which are so rare that uh, they're orphaned by the pharmaceutical industry. Nobody wants to invest the money and time to find a cure when only one in several million people have the disease. And being 14 years old, I had no money and no skills, uh, but I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to do something in my friend's memory. So together with a friend up there on the right, uh, who also was going through a tra tragedy of his own, uh, we decided we'd try and walk across England, uh, about 600 kilometers uh, from the coast, the short way, not up, up to bottom, but sort of west to east. We spent about six, seven months training and preparing and planning for this. We got a lot of support from our school, from family and friends, uh, and we ended up completing this walk in 13 days, both of us 15 years old. And in the process, we raised about 150,000 Hong Kong dollars, which was money that was unimaginable to me. And more importantly, the press talked about it. We were on the radio. Family and friends would share our journey. And we were able to raise awareness for these two causes that we really, really cared about. To be honest, I did that expedition. And that was the first and last expedition I've planned myself. Since then, they've all been accidents. I, I promise you that. And I thought that that was it. I thought I'd, I'd finished my my general kind of career as an expeditioner. Uh, I came back to Hong Kong to go study at a school called United World College for my last two years of our high school. And I did a few ultra marathons, which are kind of when you run distances over 50 kilometers, but really didn't do much. And I was in the last year of my school year when I came in touch with a, an explorer, a guy called Ripley Davenport at the time. and. I was, I was fascinated by Ripley. He'd, he'd done all these expeditions around the world, so I'd reached out to him via email, and we'd stayed in contact. And eventually, he asked me to go on a Skype call, and he was organizing an expedition to walk across the Mongolian Gobi Desert. And he was looking for a youth ambassador. There were a couple TV networks that were interested. They were looking for a young person to join. And over the course of a two-hour conversation on Skype, he asked me if I was willing to, to go and join him and walk across this desert. And I said yes without even thinking about it. I didn't even know where the Gobi Desert was. I had to Google it after the call. I had no idea where I'd stepped into. And of course, I did then. I looked at it. It's the most extreme desert in the world. We were walking at least 1,700 kilometers. 
but I had exams to worry about first, so I kind of put it at the back of my mind and focused on finishing the IB, which is what I was doing. I sat all my exams, and then I had my last exam, which I think was biology. And as soon as I finished that, I got in a taxi to the airport, whilst all my friends went to Phuket and whatever, had a good time. I flew out to Beijing, and then from Beijing I flew to Ulaanbaatar, and then from Ulaanbaatar to a place called Hovd, and then Hovd I took a little van for two days, and then I ended up in the middle of the Altai Mountains on the fringe of the Gobi Desert with 14 strangers I did not know and 14 camels I did not know. Um, so that's how I ended up in the Gobi Desert. So a little bit of information about the Gobi Desert itself. So, like I said, it's the most extreme desert in the world. Uh, the temperature ranges from minus 40 degrees in winter, it's been recorded down to minus 55 degrees Celsius, uh, and it goes all the way up to 40, 50 degrees Celsius in the summer. Uh, it's a surprisingly wet desert, so it used to be an ocean millions of years ago, and so you'll find lots of sources of water all across the desert itself. In fact, we used these maps that the Soviets had made in the 1980s, and they'd marked all the wells that they could find which wasn't the smartest thing in the world, but they were the most, the most accurate maps we could get. The reason being some of these, only about one in three of the wells we came across actually had any water in them. Sometimes they didn't exist or there'd be dead animals inside them. It's a really extreme environment, yet even within this environment, there's plenty of life. Uh, the principal inhabitants are the camels that you've seen before, um, but also it does rain every now and then, and when it does, the desert's completely, completely transformed. So that's us, by the way, in the two vehicles the team getting to the start point of the expedition. So I think my whole idea of what the expedition would, would be like changed within kind of 24 hours of starting it. Um, I was with a team of hearted adventurers that many of these people had done many expeditions before. Some of them were ex-military, a couple of them had climbed Everest. I was the youngest, I was the underdog um, by far. I had never done anything like this. And I remember that uh, none of us knew how to handle camels as well, and the camels were responsible for carrying everything, uh, water, food, our equipment with us. So we walked, it was extremely slow going, the terrain was pretty difficult, and we got to about the halfway point of the day to lunchtime, and our expedition leader pointed at what we thought were trees on the horizon, so they looked like they were about 10 kilometers away, and he said, look, it's clear everyone's trying to get used to the camels, everyone's rhythm is a little different, um, We'll go, we'll, go to the, we'll go to that group of trees, we'll regroup there, and we'll make camp, because there's a river by those trees. And it turned out he was pointing at a mirage. So everybody set off at their own pace, but in completely different directions. Uh, some people lost their camels, ended up trying to chase camels around the desert. A couple people lost their water. Uh, and it took far longer, it took six hours to do just 10 kilometers, it should have been two to three hours. And by the time the whole team got to this river and we were making camp, we were just getting ready to eat when a vehicle, a big truck, stopped by us and a couple of very, very drunk Mongolians stepped out armed with rifles. And they started asking us for beer and money. Finally, our, our expedition leader, a fantastic friend of mine, the local guide, a guy called Aggie, convinced these two Mongolians that we were a Russian special forces unit and better to leave us alone. <laughs> and, and so they did, so they did leave us alone. And finally, at you know, 9, 10 p.m., we were hoping for a little bite to eat. And then of all things that happened in the desert, it rained like I've never had it before. It was just super cold, torrential rain. Everyone got soaked. We, no one had any waterproof stuff with them. That day, I think we'd, we'd managed about 12 kilometers in total. So we'd done less than 1% of the journey, yet we were all totally exhausted and we couldn't even imagine doing another 1,600, 700 kilometers over months. And I think it was at that point that I really realized if I wanted to complete this expedition and I was counting each step, each kilometer, frankly, each day, I would never be able to complete the expedition successfully. So a little more information um, about how we were planning to complete this challenge. So we're a team of 14, like I said. Uh, I was the youngest by far, and we were aiming to do an east to west crossing of the Gobi. So the Gobi spreads mostly actually in China, but part of it is in Mongolia. And navigating the Gobi Desert wasn't too much of a challenge. The reason is, in the very far west where we started, the Altai Mountains are still there. And the Altai Mountains kind of move almost exactly west to east. So if you kind of wake up in the day and sort of face the sun and you have mountains above you and below you, then you're actually just generally heading in the right direction. So it wasn't too complicated to navigate. 
We were supported by camels and a small team of Kazakhs. So the, west, the western part of Mongolia is kind of fascinating because it's not just Mongolian nomads who live there. You have something like three or four different types of nomadic peoples who do live there still. So when the, the Soviet Union was formed, a lot of nomadic peoples were forced to sedentarize. And that means to settle down, basically, except in Mongolia. So if you want to find, for example, Kazakh nomads, you won't find any in Kazakhstan, but you'll find just under a million in Mongolia, or in the Altai Mountains, I should say. Uh, so that's, that's one area in the world where this type of life has been uh, protected. In terms of uh, beyond the Kazakh support team we had, we had these, these camels, Bactrian camels, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. And our routine was kind of really simple. If the sun rises, you wake up. When the sun sets, you go to sleep. The exception being because we had camels, they need to graze. The, and because they're, they're sort of eating like dry bushes and stuff, there is still, as you can see in this, like, a little bit of grass around. They need four or five hours. So we always have to stop four or five hours before the sunset let them graze, uh, and the rest of the day we'd be walking. So start the day when the sun rises, pack your bags. The food was pretty miserable. As you can imagine, there wasn't anything fresh out there, so we sort of had to eat uh, whatever we could find, um, goat or you know, a bit of potatoes, whatever we could buy. Uh, when people ask me what the experience was like of walking the Gobi, of course it sounds really cool, you see loads of those are cool photos, but the reality is it's like extremely boring to walk across the desert. So the analogy I always give people is like, go to your gym, you know, put a heater in the gym, find a treadmill, sprinkle some sand around, and just like walk for 10 hours. And that's basically the experience. Remember the first few days, I would wake up, and you, like I said, you could see the Altai Mountains, so I'd find like a funny looking peak. I'd be like, okay, that's, that's my milestone. That's where I'm starting. It's more or less parallel to me. And then you walk the whole day, eight to 10 hours of walking, and then you finish the day and I would look to see the progress and the exact same mountain was in the exact same spot. So the other thing that was really difficult was there's no sense of progress. You don't feel at all like you're moving anywhere. And instead of it being about how physically tough things are, it's about how mentally tough things are. Walking is also, it's a, it's, it puts you in this awkward state of mind where you know, I, I, was, I finished high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, I thought maybe in the Gobi I could like, make sense of things and that was so far from the truth because you're in this weird state where you're too tired to think properly about anything but you're not tired enough to not be bored. So you're bored and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and, and like I said, the terrain doesn't, doesn't change uh, at all. Um, you saw earlier that building with a gentleman sitting on the front, that would be like a relatively good well if we found it like that. Um, and then wherever we stopped, we would make camp. So this here is at the end of the day, or maybe it's at the beginning. Um, you know, just wherever we were, we would sit down. And some of the best moments in the expedition were when you finished the whole day and you could really admire where you were and these amazing sunsets and the silence that you found uh, in the desert. In terms of what I packed with me, because a lot of people are interested in that, my rule was one to wear, one to spare. I figured that almost everything I was gonna bring with me would get extremely dirty. And in fact, those trousers that I had, I think I wore them through the whole Gobi Desert and they were so sodden with sweat and dust that they could literally stand up on their own like pieces of cardboard. It was kind of filthy. Everything else, I think I brought a few sort of um, like fruit satchels and some vitamins because it's not that you necessarily need that to survive, but if you've gone from a diet which is rich, super high in vegetables and fruit and you suddenly go to just plain carbohydrates and meats, that can really screw your system up. So you have to do a lot of things on these expeditions where either you have to have a gradient that slowly changes your habits, which is something I learned later, or uh, you just bring some of the things that you know you need along with you so that you don't get sick, basically. So a little bit about camels. This is like my favorite animal uh, in the world. Um, that's us at the end of the day, rare moment of peace and fire. There was no wood, so we were probably burning dried camel manure. Um, it's not as romantic as the photo would make you, make you think. Um, so that's me with the camels. Everybody on the expedition had a responsibility. Um, as the youngest, I got the best job, not, um, which was to help look after the camels. And I was stuck with an 18-year-old guy, so I was 18, and I stuck with another 18-year-old Kazakh guy uh, called Albik, and the two of us were responsible for making sure the camels were in a good state. Um, if, 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 we, if any of the camels were injured, we would have to carry their weight, and each of these animals was carrying between 
100 and 300 pounds of food and water. They're really, really old animals from an evolutionary perspective. They haven't really evolved in two to three million years, but that's mainly because they haven't needed to. I, don't, I can't even name you an animal that's as versatile. So they'll be in the Gobi when it's minus 40 degrees, and they'll be in the Gobi when it's plus 40 degrees. They can survive 10 days without water, and they can easily carry loads of up to twice their weight. They are not domesticated animals. They don't really like being around humans. Um, their defense mechanism, which is probably what the dude on the right is getting ready to do, is they kind of just like chew up a bit of grass and then just throw it up on you. And it smells so bad. It just sticks to you for days. Everybody wants to stay away from you. So no one envied being a camel handler. But the, the pro side was I got to spend a long, long time with this local Kazakh nomad, Albic. And although he didn't speak English, and at the time I didn't speak Kazakh, uh, through drawing in the sand, through sort of a gesticulation, we could kind of get a sense of each other's lives. Um, you know, Albert wanted to know everything about Hong Kong, McDonald's, woman he wasn't related to, you know, stuff like that. And for me, it was this, you know, having come from school, as you guys I'm sure can imagine, so structured, you've got things to do all the time, this is endless and boundless freedom of being a nomad, not being held back by anything. So we really, really romanticized uh, each other's lives and we became very, very good friends. The other thing about camels is they're incredibly funny runners. They run fast and they run long, but it's not an elegant sight. I've got a little video to show you that. There we go. I'll tell you what though, as a camel handler, seeing that just puts, puts the fear of God into me because it means I have to chase after it. Um, they do run, they run around and it took me a few weeks to learn how to chase a camel. So there's a, there's a very simple trick that I didn't learn for too long. So if you just chase after a camel, it's like an animal of endurance. It will just keep running and running and running and running for days if you basically get across the Gobi Desert before it stops. So the, tr the trick is to just let it do its thing. So okay, it's running, okay, let it go. And then you have to run like this huge circle around it so it kind of doesn't think you're running after it. But there could be like kilometers, literally, and you come all the way around and then when you're in front of it, even if you're like a kilometer in front of it, it just stops. It's like, oh, game over, I guess it's in front of me. And then you just walk up to it and that's it. So the trick is to get around the front of the animal and then it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know it can go backwards or anything. Sometimes though, disaster would strike if we didn't look after the camels properly. So here you can see, it's, it's, that's not a dead camel, I think that's probably just some jam or something. Um, but in this case, like a camel freaked out, was spooked by maybe a snake. Uh, uh, they're very picky animals. If you don't load their weights exactly evenly, uh, they can try and, they can bolt, they can try and throw the whole, the whole load off. So what you're looking at here is a bit tragic because that's sugar cubes for tea. I really, that, that was it. It was no longer sweet tea after that. But you know, it could be food, it could be water. What you're looking at here could be like a week's worth of food, which we didn't know when we were next going to get. So we really did rely on treating the camels well in order for our expedition to proceed uh, healthily. Another little funny story is um, I had my birthday, my 19th birthday or 18th birthday in the Gobi Desert. And little did I know, but my parents had bought me a goat for my birthday, which is, of course, what any good parent will do. Um, the whole team was excited because none of us had had fresh meat in a long time. So our support team went to the local mining town, bought a goat, and we had that in the evening. I remember it was a great birthday. <laughs> and the next day, um, yeah, yeah, eating the rest of the goat for lunch, we'd had the morning uh, to walk. And one minute, it was as clear as you can see at the top of that photo, which is to say there's like infinite visibility. And the next minute, there was this like wall of sand that seemed to kind of go kilometers up, and it seemed to be like engulfing upon itself, like spitting out these mini tornadoes. And what we'd actually seen was this. I'd be really bad at Hogwarts. There you go. Um, so it was a sandstorm. And so we tried to, it was sort of coming to us from the north and we were walking west to east. We tried to outrun it, <laughs> that didn't work. And eventually we just, our, our support team told us to put the camels down and then we all kind of hunkered behind the camels as a sandstorm blew in. And I think it lasted about 12 to 18 hours or something. And definitely loud, like it's, everything is a super sandy, obviously, um, and very difficult to breathe. So we just hunkered down and then, then those weird things happened the next day. So it got very cold. 
the temperature dropped from during the day 25, 30 degrees, so I think like less than 10 degrees. And the other thing that happened is it started raining a lot. We had three days of rain in the Gobi Desert. And it's quite amazing to see because even just one day of rain in a desert and absolutely everything can transform the whole landscape. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so everything's gone green. It's, uh, it's unbelievable what a little bit of water will do in terms of life flourishing. Um, and views like this, you can imagine, stick with you for the rest of your life. That was the other thing I really liked, which I was talking earlier about, is in the nighttime, because the visibility was so good, we would be able to see thunderstorms hundreds of kilometers away in the south. You couldn't hear them, so you just see this big flash of lightning and light all over the horizon. And obviously when we could, the stars as well. The stars were unbelievable in the Gobi Desert. There's almost no light pollution. It's harder to find black empty space than it is to find stars when you're there. So after two months um, of walking in the Gobi Desert, that's me, by the way, and my camel, one of them. Um, we both have a nickname, I can't say it here. But uh, you know, after, after three months, in, in two and a half, three months in the Gobi Desert, uh, the team went from being 14 people to just four to complete the challenge, of which I was one of them. Everybody survived, but a lot of people didn't make it because of injury. Uh, because mainly because I think mentally it was really difficult. Um, and the experience had completely, completely transformed me. If I look back at what had happened, when you're in the, when you're in the desert, you quite very quickly, you, you first lose the conveniences, food in the fridge, tap water, uh, cinema, spending time with friends, little things like that. And then you start to lose your sense of status. So if you think about it, all of us are, identify ourselves by our hobbies, by our passions. I'm a student. I'm a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, whatever it is. You lose that. Nobody cares in the desert. Any, any of that, none of that matters. And then finally, the last thing you lose is the relationships with your family and friends. They start to, start, start to fade away and they become distant. And what you're left with is, is yourself stripped of everything. And the nice thing is it's not so bad when you look at what you have left. But it's something that rarely as people do we ever get the chance to do, to take a real look at ourselves and who we are uh, and be happy or, or not, but I think we would be, with what's left behind when you take away all of the noise. So I sort of learned that. And before I left the Gobi Desert, Albic and I, this, this local camel handler, uh, had made an agreement to do a life swap. So we talked about each other's lives so much, we basically said, well, you come and live as a nomad and I'll, I'll, you come and live as with me in Hong Kong as a city boy, and we'll see how that goes. And here's a little photo of us at the finish line. So looking pretty filthy, to be honest. This is the other thing, you always you, you think about the finish line for any race, and you want it to be big, and to be honest, I think we reached the finish line, and we didn't even know it was that. <laughs> it was such an underwhelming event. Uh, and then after that, I can remember we didn't do anything special or party. We sort of went to the nearest town, which was this place called Sainshand, and we had some beers and ate some peanuts. I was thinking about a cold shower and a nice cold, like a nice bed, and actually I think we slept on the ground that night, and there was definitely no shower. I ended up spending four or five more days down that area before going up, so it never really ends in a bang. It's always in a whisper, especially when you've been out there for so long and all your habits have completely adapted and changed. That's, I think, why at the beginning of the expedition, it feels like it will never end. By the time you get to the end of the expedition, you're not sure how you're going to cope when it's over, if that makes any sense. So sure enough, I went back to Hong Kong and spent two or three months saving up, making a little bit of money so that I could go out there and, and hold uh, my friend accountable to the life swap. And the basic idea was he told me, come in winter. I said, how do I know it's winter, Albert? He's like, everything's frozen. Thanks, Albic. Okay, so that's a rough guess. So he said, yeah, but it needs to be frozen because where I live, you need to go up rivers and the rivers need to be frozen for you to drive on them. I said, where do I go? And he goes, yeah, I just pointed to this area the size of Hong Kong. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah, go there. And he just asked my name. There's not a lot of people. You find a person, ask me, and they'll, they'll point you in the right direction. So these are some very, very vague plans at best. I actually, this is me, I think, yeah, by the Christmas tree. Uh, my parents convinced me, you know, originally my leaving date was October, then it became November, and then it became Christmas, and I think on Christmas Day I said, okay, that's it, I'm, I'm leaving, I've got to go, I've been planning for this, and reluctantly they agreed, so I packed all my stuff as you see here, I went to Hong Hom, and I took the 24-hour train up to Beijing, 
I spent a few days in Beijing. I think I said New Year's there, and then I made my way up to the capital city. It was actually on that train up to Beijing that I wrote my university applications for the US. So I wrote them in like 24 hours <laughs> and then sent them off. Didn't hear from them for a while. And then I took a bus, a three-day bus across Mongolia, about 2,000 kilometers of driving. And that was, a, that, was a, that was an expedition in and of itself. And finally, I arrived at this town called Olgi. I think I have a photo of that as well. Yeah, here we go. So this is me here at Olgi. Um, yeah, who looks like a tourist, right? Um, and you can kind of see there's only one road that leads into the city. Um, and I mean, if you can even call it a city. And then it's just surrounded by the Altai Mountains. And in this photo, it's probably minus 20, 25 degrees Celsius. And so I met my friend Aggie. Um, Aggie, who'd been the expedition guide for the Gobi. And fortunate enough, he met me. And Aggie sent me uh, on a bus or a little military jeep down south for a couple days. And then spent a few days in a tiny little town with the headmaster of a local school there. And then finally got on horseback and a few days later I arrived at Albeck's winter home at the end of this beautiful valley. It was a big valley and his home was at the end. He was the only people there. And after 10 days of travel, I think it had been 10 days since I left Hong Kong, and it's the first time in my life I was riding a horse, right? There are all sorts of new things. I'd never been in a temperature this cold either. And he sort of just strolled out of his house. He's like, hey man, good to see you. Come on in for some tea. I was like, wow, he wasn't even shocked. He just sort of trusted that I would show up at some point. Um, Albic's parents left, so it was just me, him, and his three younger siblings and about 2,000 animals. Um, basically, they were like, okay, there's two like, young men here. We haven't had a holiday ever because, you know, for nomads, there's no seventh day that you don't get the day off. You've always got family to look after and animals to look after. So they just sort of left and they thought, okay, yeah, kid in Hong Kong probably has cows and goats, knows how to ride a horse. Like, obviously not, but they just left me to it. And so my job was originally, uh, I would, in the morning, I'd wake up pretty early. I remember it was super cold. You always wake up with ice all over your face. And the first person to get out had to load up the stove with dried cow manure to get the stove going. You'd have a quick bowl of tea, and then you'd put some of yesterday's meat in the tea to warm it up. And that would be your sort of energy at the beginning. And then I think the first job they gave me was the easiest one. So I had about 20 cows that I had to take upstream to water. And they'd give me, they gave me this little shovel, and the, the cows won't walk across ice, so I had to just put a bit of dirt on the ice, and then they would walk across it. But that would take two or three hours just to go up into the mountains, and then I would sit up in the mountains for six hours, and then I, when it started, the sun started to set, I would go back down, and I'd have a cup of tea, and that'd be the end of the day. Life did get better. Eventually, I was promoted to goats from cows. That was a big moment for me in my nomadic career. Um, but life was really, really simple. Um, the responsibility was big. There was always something to do. It wasn't quite like the Gobi Desert. Like, there was definitely a sense of purpose to everything we were doing. Walking across the Gobi, a kind of fruitless task, but looking after all these animals, looking after his family, to be honest, the, the kids were young. They were looking after me. Um, it was a totally different life, and uh, I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. So just a couple more things about the, what it's like to live with nomads. So here, this is a photo from a more recent expedition I did, uh, living again, living with nomads, and these are horses. This particular guy was a horse lord. Um, you only eat one meal a day, and their diet is almost entirely meat. And surprisingly, uh, well, I guess surprisingly for me, I, my parents are vegan. Uh, they live healthily and for a very long time. So the, the point is they eat the whole animal, right? So there's, it's not like a lean cut steak. You sort of eat the whole thing. But it is that one meal of boiled meat at the end of the day, and that's sort of what you, all you're eating. Um, a couple of unusual things happened. One was my visit to a COS. Um, I've got some photos of that. I'll show you them now. So that's, that's what I live like, by the way. This is kind of the inside of the Eagle Hunter's home, actually, this one here. And you can kind of see a photo of him up there, uh, in the sort of top left, and that's me. This is like two months of living as, an, as a nomad, so I was pretty used to it at this point. And the and there's a felt and everything. You just sort of roll that up, and that's the sitting room and the bedroom. Um, and that's me and Albic when we went wolf hunting. So he turned 19 or 18, and he wanted a wolf. They wanted to kill a wolf for, for, before he turned that age. So we went out to what's called a cos. So it, it's there's a you can see there's a lot of snow, right? But it actually doesn't snow. The precipitation rate is really low in Mongolia. What actually happens is that you get these big ferocious winds that blow in the snow from Siberia. So even if it looks like it's snowing, it's actually not precipitation. It's just being blown in 
from the north. And what that means is that a lot of the snow collects low in the valley. And the more snow there is, the harder it is for animals to kind of dig deep and find the grass they would need, whatever's left from the previous summer. So what they do is they usually send like a son uh, or a child or a farmhand, something like that, up into the mountains, pretty high up, so three, 4,000 meters in, in altitude with about 2,000 animals. And they live in this kind of little tiny TP and they'll live there for one or two weeks. And typically these could be kids who are like 13, 14 years old. So I don't know how old you are, but when I was 13 to 14, I didn't know how to pour myself a glass of water. And these kids are sort of, like, sort of responsible, not just for looking after these animals and feeding themselves, but also there's a lot of wolves high up in the mountains. They're armed, they have guns, they have to make sure they protect these animals, which are the bank accounts of these families. So off we went, we climbed a few mountains up in the north. I think I have a photo. Uh, yeah, I, I do. This is, this is we, what we, we sort of had this kind of smart, dumb idea that if we would wake up very early in the morning, wolves are known for their sense of smell. So if we woke up at 3 a.m. and we walked to the top of this mountain, they wouldn't be able to smell us because if we're below them and they're above us, the convection currents of heat kind of raise your sense of smell up to them and they can smell you and run away. So if we were above that, that wouldn't be a risk. Um, so we walked to the top of this mountain, extremely risky. I would never do it the same way again. And that's, <laughs> that's what we look like. So it was a sort of minus, uh, at the top, I think the temperature I got was minus, minus 50 degrees with, with, with wind chill. Yeah, super, super cold. The other thing about wolves versus cats, or I should say cats versus dogs. So if you look at animals like lions and tigers, predators like them, they're actually very smart and um, reasonable stalkers. So they sort of choose one animal, typically something young, old, too old or too young, and they pick that. Well, wolves are very different. So if a wolf gets a hold of a flock of sheep and goats, uh, they just kill. That's all they do, until there's nothing left alive. And the reason they do that is they know that the carcasses of the animals will freeze. So it's like having a freezer of meat that they can go back to for the rest of winter. So whilst a cat will sort of aim for one animal and then just eat that one animal, the wolves will massacre anything that's alive, knowing that they can come back to it. So they're smarter, but in that sort of cat-dog argument, they're definitely not the friendly ones. So I learned a lot uh, through my experience with uh, the nomads. I think in the same way, in the, in the Gobi, everything had stripped me away and leaving just me and, and whatever was left. And when I, when I lived with nomads, what I could see is everything that they had was temporary, right? So there was no such thing as a possession. Not even their homes were consistent. They would pack everything up and move every now and then to different parts of the, 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 the country. And yeah, there were clothes and stuff, but there was no, no frivolous stuff, there were no electronics. I mean, the life was really simple, yet these people are extremely content and very happy. And it's in retrospect, it's very obvious why. They really, really valued each other. The only thing that was constant in their lives was family and friends and the way that they looked after each other. I would remember, I remember going to, with Albeck to the neighbor's home, sometimes it's two or three hours on horseback through the cold. We would arrive, they would make us tea, they would cook us some food, and there would be no conversation exchanged. It was just two groups of people enjoying each other's company. Maybe the one, how's the weather? Yeah, it's good. How, are your animals fat? Yes, they're fat and healthy. You know, like really simple stuff. So it was amazing how much they cared for each other. Um, and it, again, it sort of reinforced to me what really matters in life when you strip everything away. My goal at the end of my stay with Albic at winter was to do uh, what was known to be a brutal expedition, the spring migration. And this is when they pack up their winter homes and they move to their spring homes. It's actually quite a happy time. It's a really difficult migration, but things are getting warmer. Pastures start to, the snow melts, pastures start to reveal themselves, and then summer is the best time for nomads. So it's the sign of summer to come. But because that winter I was there was so incredibly harsh, the melt was really late and I had to go home. So I missed the chance to do this expedition. But I swore I would do it at some point. So indeed, Albic did come uh, and live with me. There's Albic and Aggie. That's my dad on the left, and me and my brother Nick there. Uh, he did come and live with us uh, for a couple of weeks, and that itself, I, I, I know he's coming to Hong Kong to give a speech next year, um, from his perspective, as seeing as I've shared mine, but seeing how he saw my city in a completely new set of eyes, in fact, in the set of eyes of someone who had who'd literally stepped on a plane for the first time in their lives, <laughs> you know, and then ended up getting off it in Hong Kong. It was just outstanding. Um, and we would talk, and you know, he told, said, hey, let's go do this spring migration. And, and, you know, every opportunity we sort of thought we could do it was missed. I went to go study uh, things. He went to go study as well. And then sort of in 2015, um, tragedy struck. 
So in 2015, Mongolia had a zud. A zud is the word for extremely harsh winter, uh, very long, very harsh. And his family lost over half their animals. And if you're a nomad, you can live happily and comfortably on almost no income, as long as your animals are healthy, because almost everything they need comes from the animals. But when you lose over half your animals, it's game over. So his family had to move to the city, Olgi. And I thought that the opportunity to do this expedition would never occur again. It's worth talking a little bit about climate change because for so many parts of the world, it's, you know, in, in Europe, we get more snow and the summers are warmer. It's not something we really complain about. Um, but there are parts of the world where it really truly is changing lives. So for example, the Chinese and Mongolian Gobi Desert is growing at an alarming rate. It's the fastest growing desert in the world. It's spreading 3,600 kilometers squared per year. The springs are getting windier, the summers are getting hotter, the winters are getting colder and longer. And the reality is that people would migrate perhaps between these pastures for as long as their families could remember, hundreds if not thousands of years, and one day they arrive and suddenly it's all sand. So these you know, nomads don't roam randomly, they have these set migration patterns and they can be completely disrupted by the growing desert. And what happens when a family moves to a city? Well, most people don't have a passport or proof of residency, so it's almost impossible to get a, 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 basically a job, a proof, of, proof of income or anything like that. Uh, the cities themselves are not designed for the massive influx of people who are moving into them. So there's a lot of squalor. For example, back in 2011, I remember reading a statistic that 900,000 people in the capital city shared just 90 water supplies. And when I say 90 water supplies, I mean wells. So there's like 10,000 you know, people and families surviving off one well. Um, they burn coal, and we know that in the capital city, four or 5,000 people are dying a year as a result of inhaling thick particles of coal. And without employment, and with this loss of this supremely wonderful way of life, we see insanely high rates of alcoholism and drug abuse and domestic abuse happening. So climate change not only disrupts this ancient and beautiful way of life, it forces people into like the opposite, into a hell of a life. Um, luckily for me and, and my friend Albic, his father is a very talented carpenter, so he was able to find some, some work in the city uh, simply making, making furniture and that sort of thing. So he did better than most families do. But I really thought that the opportunity to do the spring migration, this opportunity, was gone forever. So back to that point where I was on that plane at the very beginning of this talk. Uh, just a week before that, I'd got a call from Aggie. I was having a really awful, awful time in my life, probably the lowest point in my life. And Aggie sort of said, Chris, the chance has come up. Uh, there's going to be a spring migration by one of my cousins. Albic is doing it. So my friend was doing it. Do you want to go? I said, OK, screw it. I'm going. And he said, when, I, when do I have to be there? He's like, you've got to get in the plane tomorrow. I packed everything up, got on the plane, flew to UB, flew to again, got caught in the sandstorm, ended up in the middle of the Gobi, I was like, oh no, not here again. Took a van from there out to the west, and before I knew it, I was out with Owls and his family. This is the first expedition that I actually filmed myself, so rather than talk anything else, I'd like to share a film uh, that I produced while there. Yes. 
storm winds. They don't just roam plains and set randomly. They actually have set sort of parts of you know Western Mongolia they go to, and they go as often as they need to. They don't go. They don't need to. They don't go. But they need to go when the grass runs out. Animals, which are essentially their livelihoods, depend on grass to, to eat, and when that runs out, they need to move to new to new grazing grounds. Migration is a natural part of life. You know, people need to move their animals from their winter pastures where there's no more grass left to their summer pastures where there's plenty of grass left. I have stayed in touch with my nomadic friends in Western Mongolia for the last six or seven years. In fact, they've become very close to dear friends of mine, and I go back to see them as often as I can. They know that I want to do this expedition. So uh, I got a call from one of them, Aggie, who said he had relatives who were about to embark on a spring migration and would he would I be interested in joining it? And I immediately said yes. It was a bit different, you know, when I went for the first time the Gobi it was uh, it was kind of a much more physical challenge. This one there was not really much I could do by way of physically preparing. You know, we were gonna be on horseback, it would maybe be about Mental challenge to do more with the weather, hiding animals, living with the Kazakh family, you know, the culture shock that is a bit higher. And it wasn't going to be like I needed to train nine to five, you know, for three months in advance. I spent seven days living with Alus and his family. So Alus is a Kazakh man, and he's a horse lord, he's very, very well. No horse trainer in Bible Week, but I don't believe he's the best horse trainer in Bible Week. Spent seven days living with them and helping out where I could. And it's quite mundane, you know, everything from herding animals, bringing them out to sort of the grasslands, to collecting water, to uh, picking up animal defecation. Um, so, sort of sunrise, you start working from sunset, you go to sleep. to 
I was just free home. His home is nestled in the corner of this huge valley. There is no wind, there's a lot of snow, but it felt more like go out in a jumper rather than a three or four jackets. My face wasn't constantly burning from the cold. And on that night we celebrated, we, we, we drank a couple of bottles of vodka, some beer, and a big, big plate of meat to eat, and it really felt amazing. We had safely transported over 300 animals from one side of my to the other. We'd gone around eight kilometers. And no animals had died, no animals were sick. His family was safe. All of us uh, were okay. Um, and, and when it was over, yeah, it was a mix of, I mean, it was very mixed, mixed feelings. On one hand, I built these friendships and relationships with these people so deeply going through this experience with them that I was going to miss when I left. And on the other hand, we had completed what was probably one of the toughest challenges of my life. Yeah, we made it, and this dream of mine was finally completed after nine years. There's Albic on the far left, and me on the far right, and Al's and his family in the middle. So our friendship had started in the Gobi Desert in fire, and finished in the Altai Mountains in ice. Friendship hadn't finished, but the expedition loop had. So looking back, what did I learn from these three separate expeditions? Um, the Gobi taught me, I think, really what my my soul looked like, what happened if I stripped everything away, which I thought was important, was it even that important, and what was I left behind with? And then living with nomads, I think, taught me that the most important thing, aside from looking after yourself, is your family and your friends, and that everything else in life is really temporary, and that's where we should really focus, or at least that's where I should really focus my efforts, on those relationships. And finally, I think the spring migration uh, taught me that a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are designed for. We need to go out, and when we get comfortable, we need to change things up. We need to move somewhere new, and we need to be ready to leave some things behind, but always carry those things we find most important with us. So thank you very much for listening. So just in case you do, just a couple of things. Thank you for the applause. Um, if you have any questions, I don't know, Instagram's probably not a thing here. So uh, I do have an email address and I do have a website, which I think maybe I can share with you, Joe. You shared around with Philip uh, later on. If you want to get in touch or do more reading, I write a lot about these expeditions. Um, I love speaking, but I feel like there's always room for improvement. So if you want to share your comments with me on what could be improved or what you did like to hear, uh, please let me know. And then finally, uh, Found Lost is a company that I started a few years ago that sort of takes people around the world on extreme expeditions, always with an exploratory or a scientific purpose. They range from easy to really difficult, but if you are interested in getting involved, have a look at the website. Thanks again.
Uh, what an inspiration as well. Thank you. Um, so you've done the biggest challenge. What's next? Uh, yeah, that's a, there's no such thing as the biggest challenge, right? I think challenges are relative to where you are at life. Um, so I just came back from Myanmar. That's one of the reasons I was a bit slow to respond to Philip. I was doing a jungle expedition there. Uh, the next big challenge, I think, in terms of just like going out somewhere, uh, is probably going to be to climb a mountain in West Papua called Mandala Peak. Uh, it's very remote. It's very difficult to get to West Papua anyway. You have to kind of you have to go through jungle for seven days, and then it's a 5,000 meter peak to summit. It's quite technical, and there have only been a handful of people who've climbed it. So in terms of like physical difficulty, mental difficulty, that's the next big one. But I think that's only going to happen sometime next year. It's re like right now, no one's allowed in West Papua. The political situation is super volatile. So when that window opens, we can go, and if the weather's good, we can go. Um, right now, it doesn't look like that's going to happen for at least six months. But that's sort of the next, the next big challenge. Can you say that again? Sorry. It's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> if you haven't, she's just saying she's been to Mongolia. If you haven't gone and your parents are looking for somewhere fun to go, Mongolia is your place. Really rich in culture, really rich in history, and so much to do there. So check it out. Glad you enjoyed it. I hope you go again. Yeah. What, what did your friend have to say about life in Hong Kong? Oh, yeah. So the question was, what did, what did Albert, my friend, have to say about life in Hong Kong? Um, he, initially, he hated it. Like, within a few days, he was ready to leave. But then, then he loved it. So it was like very much like overnight thing. Um, one thing I remember is he would only eat McDonald's. <laughs> so there were many times where I tried to take us to like, a local, we went to Chung Chow Island, which is kind of known for its seafood. And there's, like, they built some McDonald's there recently. And it's like, right opposite the pier. So I was ready to show him the whole island. And he went straight to McDonald's. <laughs> um, the other thing is he was um, amazed by the ocean. And so the first time we went swimming, kind of came out like splattering because he'd never tasted salt water in his life. So I was like, oh, I didn't think about that. And then we went to the back of Chung Chow that same day. And I think I spent like two or three hours just sitting there watching the ocean and looking south, endless ocean. I was like kind of bored. I was like, let's go, you know, but he really wanted, he's like fascinated by that. Another interesting observation I remember when we picked him up from Hong Kong airport and drove him to my parents' home on Hong Kong Island, um, he made this comment I thought sort of, sort of so interesting. He's like, there's so many buildings, so many lights, but where are the people? And it's a really good point. You can actually get away with driving from the airport to Hong Kong Island without seeing a single person. Um, and in Mongolia, like the street is where everyone gathers together. You know, that's like the communal place. So lots of like weird, little interesting things. Um, me yeah, many, many, many more. I did, I did write a blog post about it. Um, but those are just, I, I don't know if that even answers your question. He, he, he hated it, he loved it, and there were some interesting things that he spotted that like, helped me kind of understand things differently as well. So it's, it's a good question. I'm, I think what I've learned is I'm reluctant to say that any single experience can change you forever. Um, so when I, go to the, when I went to the Gobi and I came back to Hong Kong, I remember like the sound of tap water would annoy me because water was so precious in the desert. If I heard water, it was like, where is it? Let me go get it, right? Uh, and your sense of perspective, like, oh, relationships are what's important. All the things that I really care about, university applications, grades, don't really matter in the big scale. But, like within two weeks, I was back to focusing on grades, thought I'd leave the tap on, you know. So very quickly, you kind of get used to the life. You get swept away with the life. So that's why I try and do lots of these several times a year. I gain that perspective again, feel confident. You know, I do journal as well. So if I have a weak moment or I feel like I'm maybe getting a bit arrogant with whatever I'm doing, I can look back at that journal and see how I felt back then. Um, but definitely, I think, I think everybody needs to do something like this that pushes them out of their comfort zone and... For me, comfort zone isn't just, like I said, a fridge and restaurants. It's also your relationships, your status. Like, how much do you think you rely on that? Well, you'll only find out if you take it away for a bit. 
see what's there. Maybe you hate the experience, don't do it again, or maybe you'll find what you've, maybe you find that you come back and you have the renewed energy, like, wow, look how lucky I am to have all these things. It's often how I, I feel. Um, you'll only know by trying. Yeah. 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 So um, the question was, how long did it take to complete the spring migration? Um, I think the migration took us five or six days in total. And I said the distance was 80, but I think it was about 150. Uh, no one was, we weren't really tracking it. I just asked. Um, but I was there for two and a half, three weeks. And it's not, it's, there's no date that it happens. It's kind of like hours, it goes out and goes, all right, yeah, it's okay, we'll go. So, you, so I went there first, and I, I mean, for a couple of weeks, we were just packing the home up, making sure the animals were as healthy as they could be, out herding animals, just basic day-to-day -day routine until, and then, and then it was almost like, you know, like being a fireman, as soon as the alarm bells go off, you're ready to go. So that's what happened. The original date we were supposed to leave was really shoddy weather. You saw some of the clips, it was like snowing a lot. And then the day we left, like perfect blue skies. So we were waiting for that moment, and then it took us five, six days. And the you know, actual experience itself, you, you sort of, you, you sleep outside, it's pretty cold, you have one meal a day. Um, so his family would have been in, in a machine, a Russian vehicle. They would have gone along the roads, met us where they could, but mainly just stuck to the roads. We would have tried to take the fastest way with the animals, which often went over the mountains, through mountain passes where the vehicles couldn't reach, um, which obviously, well, yeah, it slowed things down. And the animals were going, you know, one to two kilometers an hour. The day is like 12, 12 to 18 day, hours long to, in the snow, and minus 20, you know, it's long. <laughs> yes? So the question was, if, if things are really tough or they're really boring, why don't you just give up? And what, what, what keeps you going? Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yeah? Uh, well, there's, there's, there's like Spartans have this interesting idea. Have you ever heard the expression, burn the boats? Um, so the idea was with, with Spartan warriors, ancient Greek, yeah, I don't know, state, yeah. Um, when, they would, when they would go to war, and if they had to take ships, when they arrived where they had to fight, they would burn the boats so that they could never retreat. Um, I, I, don't do, I don't like sabotage the vehicle or anything when I'm over there. But I think there's, there's, probably, there's probably the reality that you can't turn back a lot of the time in an expedition. For sure, I don't recommend that until you've done a whole, whole bunch behind you. You want to know that if it's really tough, that the only thing that keeps you going is you, not like a lack of choice that can be dangerous mentally and physically. So for sure, like I was like, just this past weekend, I was in Myanmar and we were trying to cut our way through jungle um, that had never been charted before. So this is unmapped part of Northwestern Myanmar and we got lost in the jungle. Um, so we, we sort of burnt the boat, so to speak. There was no way, we can, we can go back up the mountains like a sheer clear face and there's no path. We ended up spending about 22 hours cutting through jungle to reach the nearest village. That's not the situation I would recommend you go in the first point. In terms of what helps me, I think don't ever look at the big goal. Like the bit, it's important that you have a big goal. So I always call it uh, like a North Star. So we use the North Star to walk across the Gobi because sometimes the GPS would fail. Again, it wasn't a hard place to navigate, but if we needed to, there was Polaris. When you follow the North Star, you never actually set, expect to set foot on it, right? It's just there to guide these little decisions you have. And if you come across a canyon, you don't go, okay, I guess there's a North Star walking over the canyon, right? You accommodate and you change your path. And it's the same thing for anyone who does mountaineering. When you, when you go up a mountain, you pick a route that you think works, but maybe there's a ravine or there's something uncrossable. And so you go back and you try a different approach. Maybe it snows and you're stuck you know, in your tent for a few days, and maybe you're just 50 or 100 meters away from the peak and you decide you have to turn back. So the North Star is that peak itself. That's your goal, but the day-to-day -day decisions you make are smaller goals. Like in the Gobi Desert, it would be like, oh, I'm gonna have an extra lump of sugar in my tea this afternoon. That's super exciting. So 
you know, was that 1,700 kilometers get across it, but like, I didn't really think of much, as much about that star so much as what could help me get through today with that context in mind. And maybe I have to do something completely different. Maybe we have to walk backwards. Maybe we have to stop. But there is always that bigger goal that's guiding me uh, towards the right area. And then finally, maybe you climb that mountain, right? Maybe you get across, you, you get to that North Star, and then you look on the horizon, you see an even bigger one. And then, and then that, that's the next challenge. So that's how I'd say it. Focus on taking, and this, I don't think that's unique to expeditions, right? You might have some big goals in your life. Don't worry about whether you've, uh, you're sort of, you've, you've hit them. Like, you'll just be disappointed every day, right? Think about realistic things that you can set yourself every day to do that get you just like an inch closer to that and be happy when you, when you make that small goal and then focus on the next one and the next one. Make sense? Kind of, right? <laughs> yeah? Was I afraid I might die? Yeah. I'm young. I'm never going to die. <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't. I, 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 I've only had like a couple of hairy situations. Um, accidents on expeditions tend to be freak accidents. You don't, you know, you're trying to be safe. You're not really trying to take unnecessary risks. But stampeded on by camels in the Gobi Desert once. That was pretty scary. Got knocked out. Um, and then in, I, was, I, I was stuck on an ice cliff in Mongolia once. But neither of those situations I tried to put myself in. I'd ridden camels without a problem for months when that happened. Uh, climbing them, I climbed many mountains before I ended up on this ice precipice in Mongolia. Um, I think, honestly, I faced way more life-threatening situations just like crossing roads in Hong Kong than I have in, in the Gobi. Like, yeah, yeah, it's not that exciting. It's no Indiana Jones rope swinging or anything like that. If, you, if you're, if you're going to get injured, it's going to be slow. It's like there was one woman on the Gobi expedition, super strong, fit, but she got some blisters on her toes, and she didn't look after them. So she just wrapped them up and said, okay, they'll heal, instead of doing what you should do, which every day, twice a day, cleaning the wounds out. And she ended up getting a blood infection on those toes. That happened over 10 days. A blood infection can be deadly, right? At the very least, you can end up with amputated toes. So that, that wasn't like a, you know, a life or death moment, but you know, for 10 days, it built up to the point where, where it could have been. Yeah. Right, yeah. Does some of our younger boarders yeah, need yeah. to go and get, uh, some of the younger boarders, you'll need to go and get fed. Does that make sense? So you, you need, this is a chance for you to go if you need to get, to get your evening. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, just like to say thank you very much, no Chris, for coming along. And I'm sure there'll be an opportunity afterwards to talk to Chris and ask him any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks okay. so much. That was alright. No, no, they were a team to get the Oh, yeah, no, no problem at all. I was okay. Oh, very good, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, sure, you didn't mind being put on the spot for questions? No, 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 no it's fine. That's yeah. good there are so many questions. I mean, yeah, sure. Something I said was interesting. I'll another kitchen for just another 10 minutes. Thank you very much. No, my pleasure. Absolutely Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Sorry? We can feed you as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, can you keep in touch with your family and friends in uh, your expeditions? Not always, depends. So sometimes there's mobile connection, sometimes I have a satellite phone with me, um, yeah. and so sometimes there's nothing. A satellite phone, it's like a special communication device. Yeah, yeah. Not always, depends where sometimes. I am. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Hi, Hi how are you? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, because actually, I think the desert is just like you said, it is expanding. Correct, yes. So, uh, uh, do, do you found maybe some um, uh, just like solution? I don't. I think China is working very hard on a solution, trying to prevent the desert from expanding by creating these belts, these green belts of trees and stuff to stop the soil from eroding. So, if they put trees in place, the idea is it's almost like a wall. Um, I, I think awareness, speaking about the issue, knowing what's happening is, is, is the first step. Just know that the problem exists before you can solve it, right? If it's, no one knows about it, it can't be solved. 
beyond that, I, I'm not too familiar. It's, it's, it's a part of a global problem of climate change. You know, it's no single, there's no single factor that's, that's leading the desert to grow at the rate it is. Yeah. You should do some research. Tell me what you find out. Yeah, let me know. Teach me. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's wonderful. Well done for you, for you for doing that. But uh, now we are wondering how can we make actual just like raise awareness. I think it's yeah. maybe big deal problem. Talk about the small people who are experiencing the big problems in the same way I try to do. It's quite hard when you say 3,600 square kilometers. What does that mean? But when you see someone's family is displaced by the effects that like emotionally it's harder to ignore so I think whenever you talk about problems of climate change talk about the people who are affected don't don't worry about how big the problem is just think about some of the people who are really affected in, in, in a big way um, and talk about share their stories that's what I would do okay. yeah. Thank you. no problem uh, hey In Mongolia is actually fading. Yeah. yeah but like many cities are being formed. Yep. Like correct. Yeah. People try to like move into cities and find like single yeah. jobs. Yeah. They can get like not only yeah. not only like uh, like kayaks for food, but yeah. like, a more sustainable way of life. But yeah. Like, how would you comment on this? Well, I think I don't I don't criticize people for trying to find a better way to live. Like, if someone wants to move to the city and they want a motorbike and electricity, that's their choice. So, first of all, the government has an obligation to make that a better process than what it is now. Mongolia is not a poor country, right? It's very rich in natural resources and heavy metals. And um, it's just that at the moment it's insanely uh, corrupt. So the resources, the infrastructure doesn't exist. So the government's job is to make that uh, so like, possible. Kind of like sustain the resources usage instead of like... Yeah, there's been a lot of short-term contract selling to foreign businesses. So it's like uh, we can sell this for a billion in cash and a couple of politicians may get a little wealthier or we can co-develop this mine and reap the benefits over 20 years together. And so they've gone more for the former. It's changing now due to pressure from people who are better educated and more savvy. But a lot of the damage has been done. I mean, Mongolia is unfortunately just a ridiculously corrupt country even today. So I don't think like I don't think it's anyone's role to say oh this life is worth protecting. Everyone's looking for a better way to live, and Westernization is like this very attractive thing for these families. So it's not not my job to say you can't have that. Although I think that they are happier with it before they do. Oh, they gotta go. Just send me a note on an email. I'm happy to, uh, to to address. Wow, thank you. Ah, pleasure. Thank you for coming. It's great. Thanks for that. How do we get in touch with you and like the, the RGS so we can try and maybe like get you there like yeah. school? Absolutely. No problem at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, get, I'll get in touch with you on your website. Yeah, you can you reach out to me on the website or Wendy, um, you know, Philip knows Wendy, so she she's she's been the one helping me set this up. Who's yeah. that? She is uh, works with Rupert at the RGS Hong Kong, so she's oh, kind of okay. yeah, she's full time right, staff okay. there. Got yeah. it, okay, okay, I'll get in touch with her. All cool. Right. All right, thanks for coming. Yeah. Have a great evening. Hey. Hey, hey, nice to meet you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thanks for, for having me. Taking the trek to come over. And not at all. I sat in the car for two hours. It's fine. Yeah, that's okay. And you found your passport. I did. <laughs> there could have been issues there. It'd be great explorer. That's embarrassing. You nearly got away with it till the last minute. I know. <laughs> Joe was so smooth. Well, are we going to arrange some grub for a Yes, we're going to take, take you along to get something to eat. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I'll just clear up the camera and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. That well, then I'm not eating here, am I? Don't worry, no goats, I hope. <laughs> you know, they don't actually like eating goat. It's like the insurance animal because it can kind of survive anywhere.